of a century of lights. As we talked about before, the Enlightenment saw the birth of new and odd religious movements, but many of the intellectuals who lived through the time liked to think that they were making a more rational and skeptical and less mystical and superstitious world. This is still the idea of the Enlightenment that we have today, and in fact one of the big legacies of both the Renaissance and the Enlightenment was the emergence of writers who dared treat the Bible like any other document that could be analyzed and critiqued. But as intellectuals like Spinoza started looking at the Bible through the lenses of history and science, some defenders of traditional Christianity adapted to their arch enemy's tactics and also started treating the Bible as a historical document describing literal events. This was the birth of biblical literalism. In the so-called superstitious Middle Ages, theologians were more likely to interpret the Bible allegorically and were open to ideas like the seven days it took God to create the world were not actually seven days. Increasingly in the 18th century, reactionary defenders of the faith felt they had to take the Bible and its claims as literally as the skeptics did. But who were these skeptics? Many of those who challenged traditional Christianity did believe, or wrote and said that they believed, in the existence of God or some kind of metaphysical higher reality. But they felt that the old religious institutions had become corrupt and useless, if they were not con jobs to start with. An Irish scholar named John Tolland got the distinction of being the first person in history to be called a free thinker because he wrote and published books that argued things that got his writings burned by order of the Parliament of Ireland. Things such as priests of all religions are frauds and questioning the reality of miracles and the immortal soul. Writers like Tallinn got the ball rolling on a couple of the most popular ideas about religion in the 18th century. One was priestcraft, the idea that priests who used any kind of ritual were just basically stage magicians impressing an audience for the sake of their own power and wealth. The other was rational religion. Tallinn and others basically thought that once upon a time people believed in the divine without any of the foo-foo ritual and mystic stuff. But then the priests came along with their priestcraft and corrupted the very idea of religion for their own ends. Religion was actually meant to be deeply personal and rational, giving people a way to meditate on the divine and develop ethical rules. But little, if anything, more than that. Maybe more importantly, it was also meant to have nothing supernatural in it. Think of Thomas Jefferson's copy of the New Testament that had all references to miracles cut out. Two different groups of Enlightenment rabble-rousers kept the idea of God while tossing out organized religion altogether. The first were the pantheists, like Spinoza and Tolland himself, who argued that God and the universe were one and the same. The second were deists, whose ranks included Voltaire and Thomas Jefferson, who all thought that there was a God who created the universe, but did not intervene in human affairs. But what about atheists? It likely goes without saying that the thousand and so years after the fall of the Roman Empire were not kind to atheism. In fact, there have been respected historians who have even argued that in the Middle Ages, it became virtually impossible to even conceive of a world without God. In my opinion, this is overthinking the case and underestimating the ability of people to form their own ideas, of course. 
For example, the 10th century Arabic poet Abu Allah al-Amari said that there were only two types of people, those with brains and no religion, or those with religion and no brains. A quote you could get away with attributing instead to a modern militant atheist like Sam Harris, and no one would think twice of it. In 13th century Rome, Pope Gregory IX even accused the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II of personally penning a book called A Treatise of the Three Impostors. The three impostors were Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, who had duped people into following their respective religions. There's evidence that the book actually existed, at least not until someone actually wrote it in the 18th century. Italian Inquisition records report cases like an old peasant woman who entertained the idea that there was no God after all because her family was wiped out in the plague. So clearly the possibility that God is just an idea was out there, even if people had to usually keep it to themselves for understandable reasons. But I will concede that there is one man you could call the first modern atheist in Western Christian tradition. Or to put it less dramatically, the first intellectual since antiquity to really make a case for atheism that wasn't just an attack on Christianity. His name is Paul Heinrich Dietrich, better known by his noble title, the Baron de Holbach. He came from a minor noble family in the Rhineland of Germany. But during much of his adolescence, he lived in Paris with a wealthy uncle. After attending a university in the Netherlands, Holbach eventually returned to Paris where he opened and ran one of the most popular but also one of the most radical salons out there. It was visited by Diderot, Voltaire, Benjamin Franklin, and Adam Smith, among many others. One time the Scottish philosopher David Hume stopped by. When he made a comment about how he doubted he ever really met an atheist, Holbach joked that he was now in the presence of 18 of them. As that little, little story suggests, Holbach was well known for the obvious atheistic bent in his philosophical works, even though he published these works in the pseudonym to avoid legal persecution. Although France in the 18th century was a place that was more acceptable for people to voice skeptical opinions. To give an example, King Louis the Fourteenth, sister-in-law of the Duchess de Orléans, complained, I do not believe that there is in Paris as much among the clerics as among the general population, a hundred people who have the true faith, and even who believe in our Lord. It makes me shudder. Nonetheless, there were still risks. In 1766, a young nobleman, François-Jean Lefebvre de Le Bas, was executed for sacrilege and blasphemy. Thanks to Voltaire and others who publicized the case, he became seen as a martyr of atheism, although his crimes included not just singing blasphemous songs and not taking off his hat during a religious procession, but also defecating on public crucifixes. Even if the Le Bar's crimes went beyond having the wrong opinions. The intelligentsia were horrified that he was tortured and beheaded just because his vandalism had a sacrilegious element. <clears throat> Atheists who didn't engage in their own form of unholy war may have been safer than poor de la Bar in a time when outspoken atheist nobles could be found at the royal court. Still, atheism was a favorite accusation, accusation to lob at the stars of the Enlightenment, whether or not it was accurate. Starting in 1755, the French clergy's yearly conference never failed to include a denunciation of the philosopher, ph philosophers, deliberately setting out to destroy Christianity forever and spread qu sexual immorality. To a point, this actually wasn't completely wrong. Atheism, the type the Duchess de Orléans observed, among the radical nobles of Versailles, was more about a gleeful rejection of Christianity and the morals it tried to promote. There were the protagonists of the novels of the Marquis de Sade, who go on lengthy, logical tirades about how God and the afterlife do not exist between their orgies. But you also had people like the young nobleman Philippe Egon de Corsillon, 
When he was seriously ill, Louis XIV's pious mistress, Madame de Maintenon, who happened to be a friend of his mother's, would pray with him on his sickbed. Behind her back, he mocked her pious sentiments with his friends. But Holbach went a step further. His most influential book by far, The System of Nature, laid out for the first time since antiquity a complete materialistic way of viewing the world. The book had two parts. The first was a philosophical and scientific argument for there being nothing supernatural in the universe. Nature, Holbach argues, is a self-contained system that shows no signs of intelligent design or of being intelligent itself. The second part is where the fun comes in. Holbach takes on theology and even the pantheists and deists, arguing explicitly for the non-existence of any gods. Next, he defends atheism and atheists, arguing that they are not, no matter what their critics and libertines like the Marquis de Sade have to say, immoral degenerates. Atheists are quite capable of forming a comprehensive moral system without reference to any threat of divine awards and punishment. As Holbach put it, while the atheist denies the existence of a god, they cannot deny their own existence, nor that of the beings like themselves who surround them. The relations which exist between them cannot be doubted. The necessity of the obligations which result from these relations cannot be challenged. Thus, the atheist cannot doubt the principles of morality, which is nothing more than the science of the associations existing between living beings living together in society. Naturally, Holbach makes a few statements that would not be considered kosher today. It's not that he wanted to abolish religion. Actually, he suggests that religion should be kept for the little people. Atheism, as well as philosophy and all profound and abstract sciences, is not made for the masses, nor for the majority of humanity, Holbach states. To be fair to Holbach, this was not at all out of the Enlightenment mainstream. The Deus Voltaire and other Enlightenment thinkers, like quite a few of the founding fathers of the United States, thought that traditional religion was necessary for social order, even if intellectuals like themselves rejected, rejected it. This is why Ben Franklin was the same man who said, if men are so wicked as we now see them with religion, what would they be without it? one time and wrote, I have found Christian dogma unintelligible another time. Even though Holbach was an elitist by modern standards, he was willing to stoop to satire, writing one book mocking theology called The Portable Theology. A predecessor of the much more well-known Ambrose Bierce's The Devil's Dictionary, it was a dictionary of religious terms given mocking explanations. There are gems like flood, definition, paternal correction inflicted on the human race by divine providence, which did not anticipate the malice of men and repented, making them so devious, so it drowned them to make them better. That was, as we know, a marvelous success. Liberty of thought, definition, it must be repressed with the greatest rigor. Priests are paid to think. The faithful have nothing to do but generously pay those who think for them. Sins. Definition. Thoughts, words, or actions that have the power to annoy the divine, to ruin his plans, and to trouble the order that it cherishes. We see from this that humanity is very powerful. God, in giving humanity free will, is obliged to let them sin. God cannot stop humans from flicking him on the nose. Ahead of his time is a moth-bitten cliché, but it's true for Holbach. It'd be very easy to draw a straight line from Holbach's righteous satire to Christopher Hitchens' angry snark. But Holbach is also a typical, if radical, example of the obsessions that haunted Enlightenment thinkers from Thomas Jefferson to Diderot. Although he has much in common with today's new atheists, Holbach isn't really interested in creating a new system for the world. He doesn't really envision the total death of God and a new society based on science and reason, the kind of utopian daydream that's at least 
tacitly pursued by modern atheists from Ayn Rand to Richard Dawkins. For Holbach, it's more about an endless challenging and questioning of the certainties he sees people spout all around him. Like other thinkers of the Enlightenment, even the ones like King Frederick the Great and Voltaire, who despite their own rejections of Christianity, wrote rebuttals to Holbach's atheism, Holbach was about a perpetual intellectual rebellion, rather than a final destination. You might be able to see this need to keep pushing against the wall society built around them in what I think is a poignant excerpt from a biography of Jesus Christ. Yes, you heard that right. That Holbach once wrote. In it, Holbach lets loose his dissatisfaction with the Old Testament God and his relationship with humanity in terms that the Enlightenment generation with its determination to no longer see mankind as an evil and sinful creature, would have understood. Writing about the Apostle Paul, Holbach tackles Paul's comparison to humankind, to a clay pot molded by God. But can there be no relationship between the craftsman and his work if the latter has no right to say, why have you made me this way? If this power is displeased with his work because he made it, made it badly, or because it is not suitable for his purposes, the potter, if he is not an irrational being, can only blame himself for any mistakes that appear. Next time we'll move on to religion to another element of the Enlightenment. Thank you for listening.